the Bible. And now, here is Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back into our wonderful Father's Word in the book of Kings. And, you know, I remind you that, you know, who was it that wanted to be the king of all of Israel originally? That was our father. He wanted to be the king, but that, that wasn't good enough. Uh, the Is Israelites looked around and they saw other little nations around them, other big nations around them that had a man king. So they decided, well, we need a man king as well. Well, unfortunately, probably three-fourths of the kings were less than uh, what I would call a good king, meaning that only a fourth of them were even would rank good. Uh, did any of them hit? excellent or the level that our heavenly father would have hit as king of Israel? Absolutely not. Uh, man just cannot compare uh, with our heavenly father. But it's a good time in Israel right now with the dedication of the temple and then we left off in our last lecture Solomon was offering his solemn prayer uh, at the dedication of the temple. And with that we'll ask a word of wisdom in Yeshua Jesus precious name. Uh, father we ask you to open eyes open ears. 1 Kings chapter 8, we're going to pick it up with verse 33 today, and it reads, Solomon continuing with his prayer. When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy, because, note the because, there's a reason here why were they smitten by their enemies, the reason follows, they have sinned against thee, and shall turn again to thee, and confess thy name, and pray, and make supplication unto thee in this house. In other words, in this temple that's being dedicated at this point. In other words, if they realize the error of their way, and repent and pray towards you, he's asking this to happen. And, and, and I pointed out in our last lecture that these next sequence of verses, the next several verses, especially point to the prayer of Moses in Leviticus chapter 26 and Deuteronomy chapter 28, which are the blessings and cursings. And in Leviticus chapter 26, 5, it states there that if you are under the blessings of our Heavenly Father, that 100 of you shall put 10,000 to flight. But if you're under the curses of God, as listed in Leviticus 26, 17, you shall flee when no one pursues you. And even more than that, in verse 36 of that chapter 26 of Leviticus, it states that you will uh, be chased by the sound of a rustling leaf as if it were a sword, and uh, that's, that's a lot of difference. 100 of you putting 10,000 of the enemy to flight or running at the sound of a rustling leaf. Verse 34, and the choice is always ours. Don't forget that, you know, you've you got your choice. He laid out the conditions there in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, and that is that if you do things his way, follow his commandments the best you can, uh, don't fall into idolatry, you'll receive blessings. If you don't want that, go the other way. You know, worship other gods, fall into idolatry, and the curses of God will certainly follow. Verse 34, then hear thou in heaven, and forgive the sin of thy people Israel, and bring them again unto the land which thou gavest unto their fathers. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 8. I think of some beautiful scripture, and uh, Moses is teaching there, and God teaching through Moses, I should say, that even if your people go into captivity, if they will turn and worship me with all their heart and with all their soul, do the best they can to follow me, I'll gather them back into the promised land and I'll bring the curses that I had on you on your enemies and, and bless you. But there, that's the point there. You, you have to take the step. Your relationship with our Heavenly Father doesn't depend on what God does. He's already done it. It's all laid out here in His Word, His promises of blessings or curses. Your relationship with your Heavenly Father depends on you, on what you do. And the choice is yours, as always. He can scatter His people, 
Uh, he can leave them where they're at or he can gather them back to the promised land. 35. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain because, notice there's a reason following, they have sinned against thee if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin, in other words, to repent when thou afflictest them. This word afflictest you could translate humble. And that's what God will do if you get haughty, if, if you get off on an ego trip. God will humble you, as Christ would teach in the New Testament, exalt yourself and be abased or humbled. But if you'll humble yourself, then he will exalt you. And the no rain, uh, uh, I pointed out that there's a lot of uh, references to Leviticus. So Leviticus 26, 19, uh, God said there, I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. Friend, that's dry and that's hard ground to try and plow, to put crops in. Uh, spiritually, you could think of the latter rain and the, form, the former rain and the latter rain. Uh, that uh, listed in Deuteronomy, mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 11, uh, whereby we can, as, the, as, as we plant a seed in the world today, it's up to God to provide that, that former rain that allows that seed to germinate and grow into a plant. And then as, as one develops as a Christian and learns God's word, they, they should pray for that latter rain, that rain that hits the mature or growing crops and allows them to go ahead and mature uh, where they can produce fruit. 36, then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel, that thou teach them the good way wherein they should walk. Well, how does God teach us the way that we should walk? Right here in his word, friend. I mean, this, this, is, this is the instruction book right here, his holy word. And he's willing to teach. I guess the question is, are you willing to learn? And give rain upon thy land, which thou hast given to thy people for an inheritance. And again, the blessings and the curses, the, under the blessings of Leviticus 26, verse 4, he says, I will give you rain in due season. And that again, falling under the blessings, meaning that we're doing things his way. Verse 37, if there be in the land, now count these with me, we have famine, that's one. If there be pestilence, that's two. Blasting, three. Mildew, four locust five or if there be caterpillar six if there be enemy seven besiege them in the land of their cities whatsoever plague whatsoever sickness there be now this reminded me of leviticus 26 27 where god says if you walk contrary to me i will walk contrary to you and chastise you seven times for your sins but then again, as it's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, God only chastises those that he loves. So when he does chastise you, kiss the paddle, figure out what it is that you're doing wrong, accept the punishment that God has chosen to give you, and straighten your life out. Pick yourself up and move on. That's the way you get his blessings. And the goal of a couple things here in this verse, uh, uh, the famine. Uh, anytime you hear of famine, your mind should immediately race to Amos chapter 8, verse 11, where it states that the famine of the end times will not be for bread, but for hearing the word of God. The famine is on, friends. Now what this mildew, pestilence, of course, as most of you know, is a, a plague you could think of it as. This mildew is an interesting word. Check it out in your Strong's. It's a paleness, uh, particularly in plants, uh, caused by drought. Verse 38. What prayer and supplication soever be made by any man or by all thy people Israel, note that it can apply to you individually or the entire nation, which shall know every man the plague of his own heart. This means that the plague wasn't caused by God, although God allowed it. it this is saying that, that the person realizes that the punishment being placed on them is their own fault in accepting that punishment. 
and spread forth his hands toward this house. In other words, to have conscience, uh, to repent, which means a change of heart or a change of mind. 39, then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and forgive and do and give to every man according to his ways whose heart thou knowest, or whose mind, better translated probably, you know, for thou, even thou only, knowest the hearts of all the children of men. And this is why you can't con God. Uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, the pastor said, all I have to do is repent and ask for forgiveness, and everything will be straightened out in my life. That may or may not be true, and what it depends on is what your conscience is. For you can say, I repent, and, and not have this true change of heart that we're talking about here, but you can't con God, you see, because he knows your thoughts. He knows your heart. He knows your mind. You're not going to deceive him. Verse 40, that they may fear, better revere, thee all the days that they live in the land which thou gavest unto our fathers. And those that don't revere him had better fear him. Now, in verse 41 in the next verses, it changes gears a little bit. Uh, Solomon expresses even a concern for the Gentiles, as we'll see. Verse 41, Moreover, concerning a stranger that is not of thy people Israel, but cometh out of a far country for thy name's sake. A stranger would, you could think of as a foreigner. In other words, not of the people of the seed of the children of Jacob. In other words, not of the 12 tribes. But note that this foreigner comes to Israel for thy name's sake. This means that, that the foreigner recognizes Yahweh as the only living God and is not influenced by foreign gods, small g. 42, for they, meaning the, the foreigners, shall hear of thy great name and of thy strong hand and of thy stretched out arm when he shall come and pray toward this house and the stretched out arm. I couldn't help uh, go to Ezekiel chapter 13 where God says he is against those that sow pillows to cover his outstretched arm or outstretched hands. And that's what his outstretched arm, what he wants to do for all his children, whether Gentile or Israelite. He wants to deliver. He wants to be that salvation. That's why he sent his son, uh, Yeshua, the Hebrew means Yahweh's Savior. He wants to offer that salvation to you. I hope you've accepted it. Verse 43, Hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and do according to all that the stranger calleth to thee for, that all people of the earth may know thy name. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 11, in the millennium, the Lord's day, you will no longer teach your neighbor or teach your brother. Know ye the Lord? Because all will know his name. To fear thee as do thy people Israel, and that they may know that this house which I have builded is called by thy name. Verse 44. If thy people go out to battle against their enemy, whithersoever thou shalt send them, don't overlook that. Uh, God is the one that appoints war for his children. Any time that Israel went into battle, and that's recorded in the history of the Bible, if they asked God and God told them to go, they had the victory, most assuredly hands down. It wasn't even really a battle for most of the time God was doing the fighting for them or his army. But let Israel and, or you now go into battle against the enemy and don't ask God and it's not in his will, you will lose. And shall pray unto the Lord toward the city, in other words Jerusalem, which thou hast chosen, and toward the house that I have built for thy name. What God chose Jerusalem? You bet he did. Ezekiel chapter 16. Uh, he threw his skirt over Jerusalem, and that means he married Jerusalem. That's where the eternal eternity will be. 45. Then hear thou in heaven their prayer and their supplication, and maintain their cause. 
This word cause in the Hebrew is mishpat, and it means a verdict, or in other words, or that's to say to execute judgment. In other words, God execute judgment on the enemy. But remember, there was a condition when God told them, when he sent them to go into war. Don't forget that part. 46. If they sin against thee, for there is no man that sinneth not, Solomon including himself here, and thou be angry with them, and deliver them to the enemy, so that they carry them away captives unto the land of the enemy far or near. And, you know, there, there will certainly, we'll, we'll certainly see a captivity come to be after, at the end of Second Kings, in that Israel, after splitting away from Judah, will go, have already gone into captivity when we see Judah going into captivity to the king of Babylon. When it says here that no man sinneth not, uh, New Testament reference that says basically the same thing, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, the epistles of John. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and there is no truth in us. So don't let any preacher, reverend, or anyone that calls himself a man of God tell you that no man sins, including especially when he's telling you it's he himself does not sin because that's not biblical. Yet if they shall bethink themselves, this means that to the actual translation of the word in the Hebrew means to bring back, but in other words, if they bring back their heart in the land whither they were carried captives and repent and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captives, saying, We have sinned and have done perversely we have committed wickedness. In other words, take blame, accept the punishment, and then re and repent and get on with your life. You know, all too often, I think we tend to blame others uh, when, especially if, if God is involved in it. You know, it's never my fault, God. It's somebody else caused it. And oftentimes, too, unfortunately, uh, people tend to blame God for their troubles. And if you ever do that, you need to make a note of Jeremiah chapter 23, where God makes it very clear, you are not to say the burden of the Lord. In other words, what, what evil is God going to send me today? Because if you say that, he will forsake you and throw you off. He'll also make sure that whatever you said he's at, at fault for, that you get it. So you kind of name your own poison in that respect. Don't blame God for your troubles. Don't blame others for your troubles. Do a real good self-analysis and straighten yourself out, and then things you can look for to start getting a lot better. You'll start receiving those blessings of Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 instead of the curses. Verse 48. And so return unto thee with all their heart, here's a condition, and with all their soul in the land of their enemies which led them away captive, and pray unto thee toward their land, toward Israel, which thou gavest unto their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built for thy name toward Jerusalem and the city. In other words, if we're taken captive, if we're defeated by an enemy and taken into captivity, if the people will turn their heart and worship him with all their heart and all their soul, hear that prayer. And he, he does. He, he promised that he would. Again, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 8 make that very clear. Solomon, I think, probably did a real good job of Bible study, Torah study, before he gave this particular prayer because it is so uh, intertwined with the first five books of the Bible that it's, you can see it very readily. Now, um, more on that in a minute. Verse 49. Then hear thou their prayer and their supplication in heaven, thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause, maintain their right or justice. And our Father always does. When we're in his will, when we're loving and serving him, 
touch not mine anointed, he said. He will always maintain the cause of the righteous. We always get exactly what we deserve, either punishment if we're wicked or uh, justification if we are right or upright. 50. And forgive thy people that have sinned against thee. Again, the reason the people sinned against him. And all their transgressions wherein they have transgressed against thee. And give them compassion before them who carried them captive, that they may have compassion on them. In other words, on Israel. The, the prayer is that even if they go into captivity, let the, the people that are, have taken them into captivity have compassion on them. Um, you know, and there's a, a time coming, any time I think of captivity, I, I can't help but uh, put in a little uh, uh, reminder that there's a captivity coming. All these things happen as in samples to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 especially of these end times as an admonition, as a warning. And there is a captivity coming that uh, the whole world, all of our brothers and sisters that aren't written in the book of life of the Lamb, the book of the Lamb, and I'm uh, speaking of Revelation chapter 13, no long about verse 8 and 9, uh, if you're not written in that book, you're going to worship Antichrist. You will be taken into his captivity. Verse 51, for they be thy people and thine inheritance, which thou broughtest forth out of Egypt from the midst of the furnace of iron, from the terrible oppression that the Egyptians had Israel under, and this furnace of iron in reference to the furnaces that they used to fire the bricks that the Israelites made for Pharaoh's buildings. Verse 52 that thine eyes may be open unto the supplication of thy servant and unto the supplication of thy people Israel to hearken unto them in all that they call unto thee. And if you aren't walking contrary to him, he hears and answers. He always hears, but if you're walking in his way, if you're willing to learn his way from his word, to, to take the teaching that he wants to give you, he, he not only hears, he answers your prayers and supplications. And, you know, I just ask you, how are you doing, friend? Are, you, are your prayers and requests being answered by Father? Or does it seem like you pray for the same thing over and over and over and you never get it? Well, there could be two things wrong. You could be praying for something that might hurt you and he's keeping it away from you for that reason. Or it's the fact that you're not completely walking in his way. 53, for thou didst separate them from among all the people of the earth. He separated yourselves from, he, he separated himself a peculiar people, in other words, to be thine inheritance as thou spakest by the hand of Moses thy servant. And that's what I started to get to, and I kind of stuttered there, that that points back to Exodus chapter 19, verse 5, where God said, if ye will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then will you be a peculiar people to me indeed, meaning a treasured people above all people of the earth, and all the earth is mine. He can bless you with all that or not. When thou broughtest our fathers out of Egypt, O Lord God, God chose Israel to be his covenant people as recorded in Leviticus chapter 20, verses 24 through 26 and Moses' prayer about to come to a close. And it was so that when Solomon had made an end of praying all this prayer and supplication unto the Lord, he arose from before the altar of the Lord from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven. A very sincere and humble prayer. Uh, and, you know, this is being witnessed by the people that were mentioned back in verse 1 or 2 of this chapter, all the heads of Israel, the, the leaders of the government, the leaders of the army, the, the leaders of the, the major families throughout Israel were witnessing this. And, uh, you know, it's, it's however the king or the leader of a nation goes, Normally, that's how the people go as well. well. We'll see that time and time again as we work through the kings. And 
Uh, we'll be covering a lot of history of the kings of Israel and Judah. And normally, as, as the leader of the country went, so goes the people. In other words, if you have a righteous leader, uh, then you have uh, the people are following suit. But if you have a wicked leader, the people will follow suit there as well. So I think Solomon at this point uh, setting a very good example to the people of Israel uh, of, of his righteous reign, particularly the first part of his reign. He'll have some problems, as we'll see in chapter 11, verse 55. And he stood and blessed all the congregation of Israel with a loud voice, saying, verse 56, Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto this people Israel. According to all that he promised, there hath not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses, his servant. And they, uh, I can tell that Solomon is familiar with something that Joshua said as well. Just at the time prior to Joshua's death, and Josh, it's, this is recorded in Joshua 23:14. Joshua would warn the people of Israel basically these same words, reminding them that God keeps his promises. Not one word that uh, God spoke to Moses. And let me throw in Abraham and Jacob and Isaac and David. How about you? Has God ever broken a promise to you? He won't. Those promises are there. But again, we have conditions that have to be met. Don't fail to see those and meet them. Verse 57, you can't claim the promises if you don't. Verse 57, the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. Let him not leave us nor forsake us. Here he's claiming the promise of Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6. And he won't forsake you. God won't forsake you unless you forsake him. That he may incline our hearts unto him to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments which he commanded our fathers. This is the key to blessings. Leviticus chapter 26, verses 3 through 13 make it very clear. The key to receiving God's blessings are doing things his way. Do them his way, receive blessings. Don't do it his way, receive cursings. It's real simple. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. Verse 59, And let these my words wherewith I have made supplication before the Lord be nigh unto the Lord our God day and night, that he maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people, Israel, at all times, as the matter shall require. Day by day be with us. And that's something you can ask for. I'll tell you, I'd hate to go through a day without our Heavenly Father being with me. And if you're having a rough time of it, you might ask him to be with you each day and see if things don't get better in a hurry. Verse 60, that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God and that there is none else. The whole purpose, you know, when God brings chastisement, you know, that's all he wants is for us to straighten up and recognize him and, and recognize that what he laid down for us in his word, the letter to you, is for our own good. If we do it his way, we do good. Verse 61, let your heart therefore be perfect. This word means uh, loyal. Uh, in other words, that's to say uh, loyal to our Heavenly Father and not the other heathen gods. Don't, or whole is in other words to translate it. In other words, don't divide your heart between Yahweh and the heathen gods. Something Solomon himself would have trouble uh, maintaining as uh, following his own advice, as we'll see when we get to chapter 11, verse 4. With the Lord our God to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as at this day. And we're about to have some more sacrifices of thanksgiving. Verse 62, and the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifice before the Lord. 
and Solomon, I think this means not only Solomon, but all of Israel. Now, he called, you know, he called in people from all over the nation, so some of these numbers might say that we're about to cover might sound a little bit impossible, but remember, we're talking about the whole nation of Israel at this time, and that was a considerable uh, a number of people that were being blessed at this time. And Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offerings, in other words, for peace enjoyed, which he offered unto the Lord two and twenty thousand oxen and an hundred and twenty thousand sheep. So the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. A couple things to point out here. This wasn't done in one day. Uh, we were, as we mentioned in verse 2 of this chapter, in the seventh month, and the people came to the feast, which would be the Feast of Tabernacles, which is seven days, and then also the dedication of the temple was a seven-day feast. So this was done not in one day, as some people are quick to point out, mostly the higher critics, saying it'd be impossible to sacrifice that many animals. And they'd have to do so many every minute of the day, but it was over a four 14-day period, and also I think that probably uh, alternate altars of burnt offering were set up to accommodate the large number of sacrifices. It's also written in the same uh, historical event, the account in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse 1 states at this point that fire came down from heaven and consumed the first of the offerings, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. Verse 64, the same day did the king hollow or, or sanctify, in other words, to make holy, the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord, this being the inner court, for there he offered burnt offerings and therefore making the place holy. And of course, he didn't do it himself. The priest would have and meat offerings and the fat of the peace offerings because the brazen altar that was before the Lord was too little to receive the burnt offerings, <clears throat> excuse me, and meat offerings and the fat of the peace offerings. In other words, additional altars probably erected in the inner court for the 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. but. And let's go ahead, I think we can finish this chapter 65. And at that time Solomon held a feast, this being the uh, of tabernacles, and all Israel with him, a great congregation from the entering in of Hamath, this being on the extreme north of the country, under the river of Egypt, in other words, the extreme south of Israel, before the Lord our God seven days and seven days, even 14 days. In other words, seven days they gathered for the dedication of the temple and then that joined right in with the Feast of Tabernacles for an additional seven days. Verse 66, to complete the chapter, on the eighth day he sent the people away. And as it's written in Leviticus 23, uh, verse 39, this eighth day was not part of the Feast of Tabernacles, but actually another Sabbath at the end of it, which ended the, the Feast of Tabernacles. And they blessed the king, or kneeled before the king, and went into their tents, or home, in other words, joyful and glad of heart for all the goodness that the Lord had done for David his servant, keeping the promises to the seed line and the house of God being established, and for Israel his people. And again, this would have been to close the Feast of Tabernacles this last uh, uh, eighth day that it states here, and as it's written in Second Chronicles 7.10, that he sent the people home on the 23rd day of the month. And of course, it would, he couldn't have sent them home on the eighth day of the month, or the eighth day that was mentioned there, because it's a Sabbath, and it was illegal to travel on the Sabbath. What that means is that at sundown that day, the people were released to go home at that time if they chose, or stay the night and head out the next morning. 
But you know the, the, the rejoicing that the people, they were happy and joyful when they went home. I couldn't help but relate that to how I feel on the way home after Passover celebration and also uh, the fall fellowship after having taken Holy Communion, that, that joyful feeling of such a wonderful uh, uh, spiritual uh, event happening as that. And I'm sure it was a very spiritual time for the people of Israel having such a close walk with God, seeing the glory of the Lord filling the temple, uh, just an awesome experience for them. And uh, how long will it last? Well, it lasts for a, a few years, and then we'll see things kind of headed downhill. Always the way with man, always the way with a man king. I look forward to the day that the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, returns Messiah at that second advent, and we'll have true leadership at that time, I'll assure you. We've got a short message. Won't you listen a moment, please? Free introductory package. Say, this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered. And the Mark of the Beast tape. What is this Mark of the Beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you. One time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the Mark of the Beast. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. If you've got a biblical question that you'd like to submit to possibly be answered on the air, please feel free to call that 800 number and one of our friendly operators will be happy to take the question for you. That number is good throughout Puerto Rico, Mexico, the United States, and Canada. If you are listening by shortwave radio from somewhere around the world, uh, please uh, wait till the end of the hour and our, uh, your announcer will give you our mailing address. Well, I'll tell you, the work's going on around the world. We get a report each month showing uh, the countries that are most hit, the most hits on our website. And China consistently is number two or number three, and, and I love to see that. God bless you there in China. Uh, I'll tell you, the Christians in the United States, sometimes we feel we're oppressed, but uh, I know that that, that you suffer real oppression there, and, and God bless you and your efforts there. You're in our prayers. Always good to hear from you. Got a prayer request? Well, you don't need the 800 number. You don't need a mailing address. Talk to your father directly. You don't have to go through some fancy rigmarole, uh, and I think that's the reason a lot of people hesitate to pray to our Father. They don't know how, or they're afraid they'll offend Him. He's very, very intelligent. He, he knows right where you are in your life. He knows your mind. He knows your heart. He already knows it, so talk to Him. Tell Him, you know, what you, what you like about the way things are going. Uh, ask for His help. Ask Him for advice. I mean, He'll show you the way. He wants to teach you the way, as we saw in our lecture today. And we learn that from His Word. But we do have these prayer requests from around the world, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we ask you to look upon these members of the congregation. They have illness. They have problems in their life. Father, we ask you to watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. And as always, thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions and see what's on the mind of folks. Our first question today is from Wayne in Pennsylvania. Uh, thank you for your teachings. Through your teachings, I met my wife. Well, all right. We're glad to hear that. And, uh, each year when we have our annual Passover meeting, we try to have a little uh, get-together or two for the singles. And I don't know if you're referring to that, but I think at last count there were like 30 couples now over the last probably five years that met at Passover and, and have married uh, the person they met since that time. 
probably 29 of them got divorced. No, I'm kidding. Uh, they're all still married. When we tie a knot here at the chapel, we tie it and tie it good. Our question is about flounder. Is it clean? Is it a bottom feeder? Well, flounder has fins and scales, and it is a clean food. Well, it seems like we've been getting a lot of questions on clean foods here lately, but that's the criteria established by God in Leviticus chapter 11. If it has fins and scales, has to have both, then it's clean. And this is from eight-year-old Jackson in Georgia. Uh, do animals go to heaven just like people do? And Jackson, yes, there are animals in the spirit life. I can tell you that. I can tell you that because I, I know Isaiah chapter 11 is in the millennial period, meaning that all flesh is no more and that everything, including animals, is in spirit bodies at that time. That's why the, the child can play with a snake, as it's written there in Isaiah 11, and the wolf will lay down with the lamb because there aren't any meat eaters, carnivores, they're called Jackson. But, and I know we answer this question a lot, but uh, I know a lot of people when they lose a pet, especially eight-year-olds like Jackson here, if that's the case, uh, they miss those pets and they're part of the family. And, and it's, it, it's important for us to know, uh, you know that they, they also where they'll be and that we'll have animals. God loved animals or he wouldn't have created them. And I know or I hope in the eternity that, that we'll have those animals there and, and his word promises we will. As, uh, Sarah in Pennsylvania. There is a time and a season to live, to die, to weep, and so on. Where is this in the Bible? I can't find it. Okay, Sarah, you'll find that in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1 starts out, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. And Ecclesiastes, who is it written? Too. That's always important when you're studying God's Word to rightly divide the Word. It's important that you, you know, all of His Word is for our learning, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it was written to you particularly. You know, there are divisions of subject. In other words, to rightly divide the word, you have to understand who is being addressed in Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes, written by Solomon to man under the sun, meaning us here in the flesh in the second earth age. Donna in Tennessee, in biblical times, the laying on of hands ordained a person. How do we know today if someone, a preacher, minister, whatever, is truly ordained of God? Interesting question, Donna. But, and I would answer it that, number one, are they teaching you God's Word? Because someone ordained of God, that, that, as we covered again in our lecture today, he wants you to learn his Word. He wants to teach you the right way. And the only way you can learn that is if your minister or preacher or whatever you call them is, is teaching you God's Word. The second thing I would ask is, does what that person is teaching you align with God's Word? Because if it isn't, uh, and you've got problems. And a follow-up uh, with, should we take communion and why? Please document, okay? Well... Luke chapter 22 verse 19 is the best documentation that we should take communion for there Christ says and it was at the last supper where the first communion was he said do this in remembrance of me so yes you should take communion if you wish to remember Christ yes you, you should take communion if you would like an anointing uh, or a healing Julie in North Dakota is it okay to read my Bible on my break at work? Well, Julie, you'd have to ask your boss that question because, you know, of course, there would be nothing wrong with you uh, reading your Bible on your break if it's okay with your employer. Um, and I'll give you a scripture to back that up, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18, where it says, servants be subject to your masters. And that doesn't mean that you are a slave to your boss, but that's what it's talking about there in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. That's why Christians make excellent employees if they are actually living their lives life by God's Word, because God's Word tells us if, if you're working for someone, earn your keep. 
you do the best job that you possibly can. You be the best employee at that that uh, empl that boss's place of work. Now, uh, on the other hand, I can see someone sitting down at break thinking, this is my 15 minutes and I'm going to do what I want to do for 15 minutes. He's still paying you for that 15 minutes and if you're in the break room causing problems by uh, influencing other people or annoying other people, don't be a religious fanatic. Uh, anyway, I'll leave it at that. Then you follow, and is it also wrong to go to a local church just for the fellowship even though I don't believe the way they do? Okay, Julie, I can't uh, tell you, you know, that you should not go to a particular church. That's a decision that uh, you'll need to pray about and take God's lead on it. But I would caution you on Second John chapter uh, 1, verse 10. There's only one chapter in Second John, the epistles. But it says, if someone comes to you and doesn't have this doctrine, meaning the doctrine of Jesus Christ, don't wish them God's speed. God's speed is just a, simply a salutation like have a nice day. And my point is, <clears throat> excuse me, if you are financially supporting a ministry that doesn't teach God's word, you would be in violation of that Second John 1.10 because uh, financially supporting an organization is a lot more than wishing them God's speed. But again, uh, you pray about it and take God's lead. Kadian, that's an interesting name, K-A-D-I-A-N from Massachusetts. Um, I checked the Strong's Concordance for the word Kenites. It didn't say the sons of Cain, so could you please document, okay? And she says, I'm confused, so could you please help me? And sure will, Kadian. And it doesn't say exactly in your Strong's Concordance, sons of Cain. And, and I know when you hear Pastor Arnold Murray or myself saying that, we're paraphrasing what is said there. But let's go into specifics, because I want you and everyone else to be clear on this. In the Hebrew dictionary of your Strong's Concordance, words 7017 7017 it's a you'll find there P A T R O N period from 7014 7014 is the word Cain 7017 is the word Kenites now to find out what that abbreviation there patron period means, you go back to the very front of your Hebrew dictionary and you'll find a whole list of abbreviations there and patron you'll find is patronymic. And if you're like me, you had to get the Webster's Dictionary and look up what patronymic means. Patronymic means uh, that the children are named, the name is derived from the father or a paternal ancestor. In other words, Kenites the children or sons of Cain. Tim, I hope that helped. Tim in Georgia, I don't know if it's humanly possible for me to attain the level of knowledge and understanding that you have. And Tim, I know you probably wrote this. I don't know what the date is, but I'll bet you're referring to Pastor Arnold Murray and because I, I sometimes feel the same way, you know, and people often ask me, you know, about his knowledge and his able to quote scripture off the top of his head and my ability, I compare my ability to his ability to that of a pimple on an elephant's posterior. So I know what you're talking about. It's rather intimidating. Uh, it's awesome. I believe that I've been called to evangelize. My question is this, should I just sit down and shut up because I don't have your level of understanding, or do I preach what the Spirit has given me to preach? I don't want to miss out on what God has for me, and I don't want blood on my hands because of my silence. Okay, Tim, and uh, let me say it this way, there, there's a big difference between teaching and evangelizing and if you feel like you've been called to evangelize and you have the basic skills to communicate with others what God's Word says about uh, being saved which to me is what evangelism is all about calling people to Christ it doesn't require in-depth knowledge and level of understanding that you are mentioning here about Pastor Arnold Murray 
And uh, one word of caution, though, that, that I give to anyone that is thinking about uh, becoming a teacher slash preacher, uh, read First Peter chapter 4, verse 17 very carefully, for it states there that judgment begins at the house of God. And that's right. You know, that's right that that's the way it is because preachers are responsible for leading God's people in the right direction. And if they do their job right, which is by his word and teaching his word, they don't have anything to fear on Judgment Day. In fact, is Judgment Day means rewards, big time rewards for them. But if they're leading people down the road of the rapture theory, I sure wouldn't want to be in their shoes on Judgment Day. Robert in Illinois, it seems that when I anoint myself and my house, that the very next day I find in my home unwanted varmints, bugs, roaches, etc. I know this should not be. What am I doing wrong and how can I, it be fixed? Well, Robert, I would get some bug spray and a roach trap or call an exterminator, you know. I don't know what you think, you know, when we, we'd say that anointing your home will cleanse your home, we're talking spiritual level, Robert, not, not bugs and crickets and roaches. Um, you know, again, some good bug spray will go a long ways to getting rid of those, but don't expect your anointing oil to take care of something. You know, use the old noggin and we can get it taken care of together. Jeannie in Arkansas, I have a question for you concerning the two different accounts of the children of Israel murmuring, murmuring against the Lord as mentioned in Exodus 17:6, and then again in Numbers 20, 10, and 11. They look to me like two different times the children started to contend or strive with the Lord. The first occurrence was at Rephidim, and in this instance, the Lord told Moses to strike the rock with his rod, and he did so, which produced water for the children. In the second account, in Numbers, it was at another place, Kadesh, and you're correct. This time, when the children started their murmuring, the Lord told Moses to speak to the rock, and it would bring forth his water. Instead, Moses struck the rock. Please help me to understand the difference in these two accounts and in account number two where he struck the rock instead of speaking to it and did it twice and what this means. Okay, Jeannie, you're right, absolutely right. It was two different accounts. A lot of people read it and say, well, the Bible contradicts itself. No, you're right. It was at two different locations. Now, and yes, God did tell him to strike the rock, which he obeyed the first time. The second time at Kadesh, God said, speak to the rock very specifically. But then Moses went out in front of the people and he said, hear me, you rebels. Must we, referring to himself and Aaron and God, bring water forth water out of this rock for you? And then he struck it like he had to strike the rock. Moses himself had to strike the rock that God didn't have the power to bring the water out of the rock himself. You know what that cost Moses? That cost Moses his ticket to the promised land because God was infuriated with him. Why? Well, I think it's a type to the elect today. What is it that the elect are called upon in the very last times as they're called up before the, the councils and the synagogues, meaning the churches? They're to speak. What, who's to speak through them? The Holy Spirit. And if we're supposed to speak and we take it on our own shoulders, hear us, you rebels, and start saying what we think instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to think through us, God will be infuriated with us as well. Why? That's the unforgivable sin, and it won't be accomplishing his will. So the point when God says, speak, speak. When he says, strike the rock, strike the rock. Obey God is the point. Diane in Ohio, Pastor, I know you don't believe in the flyaway doctrine. Could you please explain Psalms 90, verse 10? God bless you. God bless you too, Diane. And uh, Diane's pointing out a scripture that paraphrasing says, uh, we have 70 years in the flesh. If we're lucky, maybe 80. The flesh is soon cut off, and the Bible does say in English, we fly away. 
And if you're trying to say, Diane, that that proves that there is a flyaway down uh, doctrine that's actual, factual, I can shoot holes in that in a hurry because you got to follow your subject. Rightly divide the word. The subject is when we turn 70 or 80 years old, then we can fly away. So if there's a rapture, only those that are between 70 and 80 years old are going to be raptured out of here. Is that what you're pointing out, Diane? And I don't know if you agree with the rapture or not, or you're just asking my comments on that. So what does fly away there mean? We live to be 70 if we're lucky, 80, and then we die. That's all that that scripture means. And Diane, I think you knew that probably. Tom in Oklahoma. I thought there was to be no unhappiness in heaven, but because people who have no works here will be crying in unhappiness. Please explain. Well, it depends, Tom, on what time frame we're talking about here. Now, if you're talking about there not being unhappiness in heaven now, you're wrong. You need to read Luke chapter 16 because there's a man there that's real unhappy. He died and he went to the wrong side of the gulf. Why is he unhappy? Because he realizes he messed up big time and he asked for permission to go back down and tell his brothers how bad he messed up so they wouldn't mess up. And the message is that God said, I sent the prophets to them and if that's not enough that's too bad in other words if they don't read their bibles well enough to know about the other side of the gulf they can just stay over there and they're miserable over there it's documented uh, now if you're talking about heaven in the eternity no there will be no unhappiness there uh, as it's written in revelation chapter 21 verse 4 no sorrow no crying no pain no death and in, in Revelation 22, verse 2, it states there that there will be the tree of life. And once a month, everyone will come and partake of the leaves of healing from that tree of life. I believe that means that there will be no boredom, no unhappiness. Everyone's going to be having a real good time in the eternity. Why? Satan is out of here. He's in the lake of fire at that time. I'm way out of time. i got to tell you all I love you a great deal because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. You wouldn't be in watching this program right now if you didn't. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? But most important this, you stay in His Word every day. Every day in His Word is a good day. Do you know why? I know you do. It's because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736.